Thank you for joining us on Worldwide Slot Car Chat number 39. I'm your host, Greg Gaub. Today we have most of our regulars as usual. Uh, John Kitt, Dennis Sampson, Mike Maurer, Left Linkert, Wayne Lander, Garth Frud, Lloyd, Kelly. I'm sure we have uh, Chris and other people on there. If they're not already here, they'll. I'm sure they'll come in later. And Ray's uh, here. What was that? Ray. Ray's here. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, it looks like everybody's pretty much. Uh, I've named everybody. Other Chris actually isn't here yet, but maybe he'll come. No big deal. I'm sure he's got better things to do than <laughs> try to teach us how to stop being stupid about slot cars. Uh, <laughs> So as I normally begin with show and tell, uh, I'll offer up the the floor with show and tell. I have a few things to show myself, but I won't go first. John, go ahead and show your, your Porsche pictures. Yeah, uh, if that's okay. I would finally finish this. Um, I'm just going to, oh, hang on. I have to go back to sharing screen here. Sorry about that. Uh, share screen. One moment. Here we go. And I'll go over here and share. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yes, that looks like a car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when you look at that, that is so cool. Beautiful job, John. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Look at it. Now, one thing I did do is I actually hand painted the, uh, the number and the uh, class on the side uh, uh, to make it look like a a, a club racer from the 50s in California. Mm -hmm. Well, you could have cut cut little bits of tape and done the same, but that looks great. Exactly. That was the yeah. other thing I was thinking about doing was tape or painting. And I thought, you know what? I, most of the pictures I found, I've got this great book by Tom Burnside and um, Denise McCluggage called American Racing. And they've got a grid of Porsche speedsters in uh, a track in Texas. That, there's 10 of them. I mean, there's like over $2 million worth of cars there about to like slam into each other. Now I did a little comparison uh, to the Ninko and the Ninko is a wee bit wider, but not as long, which is interesting. Oops, that's a bad photo, I apologize. Um, there it is on the track and yes. now just- <laughs> Is Ninko the only other uh, manufacturer mm -hmm. of, the, of the 356? That, that I know of, yes. Yeah, this, this is actually a, a model made by Tomy in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to show that the, you know, the, the front trunk actually opens and there's, uh, hopefully you can see spare the battery wheel. in the front and the spare wheel and the gas tank detail. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then there's the engine, the model engine. Mm -hmm. And oops, that's another bad photo. That's the figure that comes with the kit. That's a lovely little figure. And that's a bad photo of the figure, that's but kind of cool. that figure came with the model kit. It did indeed, yes. Wow, that's cool. I don't know why she's on the track, but there you go. <laughs> and that's that's it. But I, I just um, thanks for letting me show it off. I thought that uh, fine, and of course I'll be haven't driven it on the track in its form yet. That's tomorrow, and I'll get it on on camera, and that'll be the next episode for um, uh, Scale Car Garage. Awesome. Very, very, cool. very nice. Beautifully done. Very nice. I, I love the I love that you've got the uh, the buttons and everything on the on the tonneau mm -hmm. cover and all that. That's oh, lovely. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing yeah, that. Thanks John. for watching. Appreciate it. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to show and tell? New car. New I got a couple of photos if think? anybody wants to look at my stuff. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, let's have a look. See, let's go here. Can you see that? Oh yeah, red uh, and yellow. Red and yellow. Yeah, yeah, just a, a customer car that went out today. Um, this one for uh, racing on the, those king tracks, the big bank, hundred and fifty-five foot tracks. So there's very, wheels. Why very are there low. front wheels, Dennis? There's why? not supposed to be front. There's not supposed to be front wheels. No, no. In, re in retro car racing, there are front wheels. And the reason yeah. there are front wheels is because I make money selling those front wheels. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not quite, but um, I, I designed and uh, manufacture and sell 
uh, these little front sets of front wheels which have two ball bearings in each wheel um, to give nice low rolling resistance and particularly uh, on those cars that go on the bank to, uh, the big bank tracks as the car goes into the turn particularly the big turn at the end of the straightaway there's a lot of centrifugal force pressing the car down onto the track so uh, the ball bearings help to keep the speed up as the car goes through there because otherwise if there's just um, regular aluminum hubs running on the stationary uh, steel axle uh, it, it tends to bind a little but that's uh, for a retro class yeah so that's one of the things i was doing these ones i did for electric dreams that's two of those uh, um, nsr uh, 86 89 formula one kits uh, which i did one uh, using the uh, Spanish decals that come from Atalaya, uh, the PK Honda and uh, Lotus and uh, Senna Williams. Um, once again, very, very, very nice decals. Uh, I actually did one for myself the other day too. There we go. Uh, that's an that's an MB slot uh, Ferrari uh, F430, I seem to remember, and I found the set of decals also from Atalaya for a 458, which is not a lot different and put them on here. And the car came out really nice. It looks good. Yep. It was again, a white kit. Um, again, again, I have to say, Dennis, I love, I love your track. Oh, thank you. But yours is just as nice, if not better. But I, I have like this one spot that I can do that, do all the, the photographing mm. right in front of the pits. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same here. We, we haven't done all of the landscaping yet, so I, I understand. Just, yeah. just pick a corner and put some fake grass on the outside of it and you're good. Uh, I, yeah, I could do that on a bunch of other corners. I just always do it there because it's visually a bit more interesting. Yeah. Well, those are beautiful cars, Dennis. Yeah. And you can, and sir, I'm sure the, uh, the future owners will be very appreciative of your work. Well, I hope so. And uh, yeah, I think... I'm trying to remember, I, I'm pretty sure that F430 is the same kit uh, car. It's a slot car, right? A white kit slot car. Yeah, MB from, slot. MB, from MB slot. Yeah, and it's tons of tiny little parts mm -hmm. <laughs> for like the lens, the, the taillight lenses and the headlight lenses, yeah. Yeah, it's it's almost like a plastic kit with 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 a, with a chassis and a motor. But, but it's, it has all, it's a... It's quite a nice chassis. It's a yeah, it's a potted a, chassis, right? With long, springs a long can potted suspended chassis. Yeah, um, I guess similar to the fly racing stuff, yeah. um, goes pretty well. You know, I've put decent tires on the back and so on. Goes pretty well. It's a little, a little top heavy. Um, <laughs> for the, for the, did, did did you pick it up when they were going on eBay for like thirty bucks a pop? The, the uh, unfortunately, no. But uh, I got it from Electric Dreams. The, the reason I'm familiar with it is because several year several years ago, geez, time flies. Uh, the one yeah. of the guys in the digital club said, "Hey, there's this guy selling these white kits for this fairly nice looking car for yeah. thirty bucks on eBay. Do you want to just do a group buy and have a series for it? And everybody oh. has to build and paint their own car. And so we so we said, yeah, I mean, it's a good it's a good sure. car. And then once we yeah. got it, it, they're good. They're pretty good running cars too. Yeah, they are. Yeah, no, they're nice. I yeah. have one of their Pagani Zondas as well. Uh, that's the other one, yeah. And yeah. that's a that's an even better car because it's a lot lower and sleeker. Uh, that thing's a rocket on my track. Yeah, I think. Anyway, didn't yeah. wasn't um, didn't their Zonda body get reused under Scale Auto or something like that? Scale Auto have a Zonda as well. Yes, it may well be the same one. I I, miss, I have them both. I've never bothered to actually compare them side by side it might uh, just be my poor recollection but for some reason oh no, you're probably right because scale auto have done that with other things like their um like their uh, toyota gt1 that was the pro slot body or the mrc body or somebody's body i don't remember now yep 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 very cool thanks for showing that off again uh you're does welcome. anybody else have anything they want to show and tell before i start showing and telling my own show and tell i guess we could Look at the Porsche. Go ahead, Mike. Um, so this is the uh, 917-10. You can see the detail on it. I've uh, 
I've hollowed out the inside of it um, quite a bit to chip it um, and put different wheels on the on it. Um, it's pretty nice, uh, but slow as a stone. Oh yeah, this is the fly version that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's a, there's a 3D uh, printed chassis in its future. <laughs> and uh, and then we were talking about the uh, uh, Revoslot Porsche, and I don't know can if you can see. Oh, pull it back closer to you. Yeah, pull it. Pull it, pull it back like under your chin almost. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, you cut the whole front end off. I cut the front end off, and uh -huh. there's a piece. I don't know if you can see. Pull it back towards you. That's better. You can see that. Oh the, yeah, you've spaced the, the spaced it up a long way. Yeah, yeah. it's spaced it up two millimeters. Wow. Yeah, and, and there was no problem at all with it, you know, being too low. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and it the was. Same at, and the same at the back. Uh, no, I have not done it at the back. Um, okay. I'm I I'm thinking about that, um, but um, this it's got. Or if you can see. There you go. Oh, your it's magnets at the back. Screws. Eh, don't. No comments. <laughs> um, if you can, if you can look at it, I don't know if you can see the screws that hold the motor in. Yeah. Uh, the mm -hmm. motor retainer. Yeah. Those hang down quite a bit. Yep. So I don't think I can I can uh, bring it down quite as much. So you I'm looking just... for some stock to uh, bring the back down just a little bit. Yeah, you can you could change those screws out for the ones that are on the newer Revo slots because they are much flatter okay. head. Yeah. Or you can find some uh, scale auto or Plafit uh, two millimeter screws that have a very very flat head. Right. Yeah. Well, this is this is the body that's. Yeah. That. So, yeah, it's nice. I like the bodies and I I like the way the Revo slot cars look, but performance wise, they're really heavy. And uh, and and didn't handle all that well until I started doing this. Yeah, they're yeah they're, I mean they're metal chassis, you know, and the yeah. And, and they're, well, they're I was I, I, I was thinking about Swiss cheesing, you know, I'm thinking about that, especially on the side pods. And I actually want to think, find out a, a lot of the retro cars that the brass built cars have uh -huh. extended side pods like that. And I wonder why they're out there when you build oh. them like, like the 124th retro cars, especially. Yeah, well, but that's the only way to mount the body. That. Uh, that's the only way to mount the body. Okay. Because remember, well, that's a, it's a vacuum form body. Right. And so- I, I do race the retro car, so I, I'm familiar with that. But um, a lot of times the weight is out on the outside. Mm -hmm with the with that and the inside is fairly hollow yep uh, what's the reasoning behind that do you know get the weight at the edges of the car mm -hmm. just uh it it um it increases the polar moment polar ang polar moment, moment of, of inertia so it uh it stabilizes the car out there i mean i've tried it the other way around too by concentrating all the weight in the middle of the car mm -hmm. um and uh it just gives a different feel of a car. It's the it's the total weight that counts more than anything, more than the so much the distribution, and it changes from one track to the next. You know, if if one had a, a track with a lot of very twisty little bits, uh, then maybe centering the weight would help get you through the the wiggles oh. or, or s's. But uh, a lot of the tracks that we run are wide sweeping turns, and you want you want the weight out on the edges of the car. Yeah, the one twenty fourth track that I run is a run is about one hundred twenty three feet, and has a, a couple of bank turns in it. So, where is it? Uh, Malaga, Washington. Oh, okay. So it's a hill climb or something like that. Uh, it's Green Hornet Raceways. It's called. Uh huh. It's it's on Facebook. I know that if you want to look yeah, at it. Yeah. Yeah. So. But you run against my you run against my buddy Rick Dodge every now and then. No doubt. Oh yeah, I've I've raced against Rick. Um, yeah. He uh, he had a stroke not too long yeah. ago, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's recovering yeah, pretty he's well. Recovering now. Yeah, so. I, I I have one of those same. Uh, the, oh yeah, the same one. Uh, do you know the background of the TSW that's on that car? No, I do not. All right, so it says TSW alloy wheels, and 
The guy who started that company is a fellow by the name of Eddie Kaizen, who was a South African race driver. Mm. And uh, he started, initially it was called Tiger Sport Wheel. And ah. he started uh, and back in the 70s, when I, it's mid 70s to early 80s, when I worked in the auto industry in South Africa, he came knocking on our door at Chrysler, South Africa, trying to sell us his aftermarket uh, aluminum wheels. Uh, thinking that he could get into the into the uh, original equipment market uh, instead of just the aftermarket, and um, <laughs> we had we had some very uh, interesting uh, discussions about uh, about engineering in those days. Because quite honestly, at the time, his wheels looked like they'd been cast in a sandpit from melted down Ford pistons or something. They <laughs> they, they were horrible. He had no idea about ultrasonic crack testing, uh, about magnet, magnet crack testing, anything like that. And we broke his wheels one after the other. Uh, and the poor guy didn't really know what to do except go back and uh, thicken up the casting wherever he found the crack the last time. And all of that, all of that did just, just move the crack somewhere else. So, uh, yeah, for about a year, we spent a lot of time testing his wheels. But he got it right eventually. He... He, he really put a lot of money into um, into getting decent equipment and a, and a lot of crack detection and ultrasonic and X-ray and infrared and all kinds of other weird things uh, and made some really good product afterwards and then in later years moved the business here. Interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> yeah, have you seen that? The, there's that new blue Polycar uh, Lotus 72, the Ensign. With the Ensign yeah. cigarette adverts, that's Eddie in that car. The same really? guy. Yeah. Huh. It's a gorgeous it car. car. It is a pretty car. Speaking of pretty cars, does anybody yeah. else have any show and tell before I show and tell my show and tell? Big Dan, raise his hand. Go ahead, Big Dan. Big Dan, sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone. I was a little bit late getting into or changed computers. What I've got here is following up from last week when we we're talking about the size of the 36D. There we go, Com compared oh, yeah. to the S10. Yep. Yep. Um, also, also, while I've got this picture up, Cox and Escort. So, and uh, so, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah, that's right, Dennis. Yeah. Uh, while I've got the picture up, this and said that okay. Th this is we're, there was a, a topic of oh, several meetings ago about Japanese manufacturers from the from the sixties. This this is uh, from uh, uh, someone called Tokyo Plamo. It's not in very good condition, but I, I dragged it out mainly because it was the quickest way I could lay, lay my hands on a 36D motor. But I, I've, made, I've made a listing, which I might put up later on, about up to um, 14 or 15 Japanese manufacturers that I've had something from over the years. And I, I was reading something in a slot magazine just a few weeks ago that there actually were about... 31 companies, uh, Japanese, that uh, were in the market in the, in the 60s. So, um, it was me that brought up the size of the 36D motor last week, and uh, I've got another question following that. Uh, in my uh, experience, uh, brushed motors like these are normally defined by the winding specification. You're, you're saying 36D. Does that mean that there's 36 turns of, uh, of double wrap wire in the armature, or does that actually define the cam? It's, a, it's just a, a pure can sizing from uh, Mabuchi and Sun and stuff. The wines are that problem. Yeah, the, the, it has nothing to do with the wines. Mm, yeah, uh, Mabuchi uh, motor nomenclature is normally two letters followed by a number like FK180, FC130. And I, I just can't understand why 36D. Well, back in the day, in those days, it would have been an FT36D. Right. That would have been ah. its original its original um, designation. We just never bothered with the with the letters in the front, right? So uh, did they come with the variety of wines on the armature, or uh, were they just a standard? Um, from from uh, Mabuchi for the slot racing industry, uh, they were pretty much a single wine. Chris may remember the actual wine of them, uh, but. Um, American uh, small companies took them very quickly and started rewinding them. 
not so yeah, much 36s, yeah, look- but the, the, the FT-16 and 16D that came that came after them, the smaller ones, uh, that formed the basis for uh, for pro stock car racing all the way through the late 60s and early 70s. And is it out of production now, that can size? Oh, yeah. good. Ages. Ages, yeah. ages ago for what we use. I mean, if you go on the Mabuchi website or something, you may find something comparable, but... No, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> yeah, went the, to the Mabushi website and they've got I motors. As soon as they get a, big, got yeah. As soon 30, as they get bigger than a, a an FK one hundred and eighty, they become cylindrical like a typical yeah. uh, RC car motor, round. You know. Yeah, that's a thirteen UO. That's a thirteen. Yeah, thirteen yeah. UO. With an FT in front of it, if you want to be technical. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that, that, that is actually the little brother that the chassis Chris had on last week. That's the AMT 30 second scale chassis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice little chassis, actually. Yeah. Pathetic little yeah. motors, unless you put some work into them. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, ha- I haven't counted the wines. Uh, it's it's it, not a wind issue with don't those, bother. it's a magnet no, issue. It's magnet, yeah, they just don't have enough magnet. Yeah, they don't have any magnets in them. If you pull the magnets out of a, uh, an SCX uh, RX-41 or something like that and put them in there, uh, it'll work better. Yeah. And and just to Wayne, when back in the 60s, all the, all the Cox and Ravel and Monogram and Classic and everybody who was buying motors all bought them um, from Mabuchi. The only, I mean, there were minor differences, but really the big difference was the color of the can. So Monogram would say we want red cans, Cox would say we want chrome cans, Uh, AMT wanted purple cans. You know, dynamic wanted metallic pale green cans, etc., etc., etc. So, um, and I, AMT wanted purple cans. Yeah, those are those are all AMT. Well, not much changes because you can you can bespoke order what you want as long as your order is big enough. Even today, so you know it, they were doing it all 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 the way back then. Yeah, and yep. and the problem with those motors was by the by the time um, they started launching aftermarket parts like Arco 33 magnets and shims and all that stuff. The industry had already progressed to 26 Ds, which was a size smaller. And then very shortly after that came the 16 Ds, which were half the size in comparison. So the handling and the and, and what you could do with motor orientation, putting it now yeah, in, a, yeah. in an angle winder or a side winder, just changed the whole the whole thing. So a lot of guys still use 3060s in drag racing and retro racing and done up. They're 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 great motors, but they're heavy. Well, Chris, did Rusket also have 3060s? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But the Rusket ones, as I recall, maybe they were the early ones that were in Bell Drive. Yes. Okay. Because there, there were, there were, there were at least two variants of a of a the Mabuchi FT thirty six. The the regular one, which had uh, end bell drive, so that the shaft was long out of the end bell side, yeah. and it had a big, uh, basically cylindrical brass end cap on the on the uh, can end and yeah. then the later ones which was the the 36d which is the the can drive ones which have the little groove around that big brass end cap for a circlip attachment yeah and then of course cox went to the what they called the nascar motors which was made by johnson in hong kong um which was the same size but just a, a, in a different shape the one that that big den showed was one of those uh, with that funny um, different um, pressing on the end of the can. Yeah, because even, even Cat Cox chassis in the 60s, the sidewinders were different because some were end bell drive and some were can drive, right? Yeah, the very early ones were end bell drive, like the, the Ford GT. Right. But although you could get both for that car too. Cool. And did they make them both ways around so that they could fit into different chassis configurations, or is there a preference for can drive versus end bell drive? Myself, I would choose can drive all the time. Yeah, I think that what happened was that uh, we all started with can with end bell drives because that was what they were using uh, elsewhere. Uh, 
in other words, in non-slot uh, environments where it was, they were screwing them in. And then we started to realize two things. Number one, the bushing in the, in the end bell is very small. Uh, number two, two screws into an old nylon end bell like that uh, is not a very good way to attach a, a motor to a chassis. And so then we started looking at, at the other options and everybody changed over because you get better bearings and, uh, and a better location. Big Dan's got yeah. a, looks like a, a KTM or a Chemtron. It, it does, Dennis. Um, I, just, I feel like I'm talking to myself. And <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, actually a, it's actually another Japanese brand. It's called Gakken. Gakken. Um, yeah. They, they did actually make cars, and I, I didn't realize that till I looked on the LA Museum site and, and found that there's a couple of pictures of Gakken cars. I've never seen a car, but I somehow, and I don't know where, I think this is in a, some job lot I picked up ages ago. That's the Gakken, you know, what they call a padlock motor. It's got the laminations, of course, there, and uh, quite hefty brush gear on the end there, if you can see it. Uh -huh. Brushes and springs, yeah. And if I could just do a, a couple more, you know, Japanese retro things. Um, oh, is that, does that come over the right way around up to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, is a, this is a kit from someone called Nichimo. Again, I bought it a few years ago. I haven't finished it. But I did get the body painted. It's cool. stingray in the uh, Sunoco Penske colours with some some decals from Pato in Australia. Yeah, it, that's, uh, uh, that's one twenty fourth. Yeah. Now that's one thirty second, John. Oh, nice. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I've resisted the temptation to put it on another more modern chassis so far. So. No, no, yeah, it's got to go on its original chassis. But it's got to go on the original oh, one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, what I what I'll do, uh, the, you know, the box, the pieces are loose in the box. Before next time I'm on, I'll take some pictures and put them, say, in a PowerPoint show or something like that. I, I, How I old is that? I'm oh, sorry. How old oh, is that about, then? Yeah, mid mid nineteen sixties. I, I and is it not box. better to keep that thing in the box rather than build it and use it? Oh no, it's not cars are They're all used. doomed anyway. Build <laughs> yeah, it. Well, I do, it. I do, I do, I do agree, but. <laughs> uh, is it not a uh, collectible value now? Is it not a case of how it ever original is best? No, I don't know. The market is literally dying off. Yeah. <laughs> We're the market. <laughs> By the way, I love the box art. Oh, man. Oh. Hey, hang on, John. I'll put it up again just for you. Yeah. Oh, oh look at yeah. that. Isn't that gorgeous? Cool. Oh, yeah. Awesome. So even got some, even got some pictures of the other models in the series on that. Oh yeah, let's see, let's see. Oh my gosh, the manta ray. A manta ray. Yeah. And a GT three fifty. And pull it back a little towards you so it focuses better. Thank you. Oh, it's Ferrari. The blue, the blue F one looks like a Porsche, maybe. Yeah, it's a blue Porsche. Yeah. Cool. That's really yeah. cool. Wow. Um, Be nice to find those. Eh? Yeah. If, if <laughs> I'll, I'll, turn, I'll turn it back around the other way, you can see a picture of the chassis, what the chassis looks oh, like. Oh, it's oh, it's oh, actually oh, a oh, hinge oh, drop arm. Put back a wee bit. Up, up. That, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that. Ah. Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And, um, nice. the, the motor, the motor on the motor on my left or your right, as it may be, that is actually an FT sixteen. The, yeah. the D usually sig signified in uh, can drive, can drive, mm -hmm. yep. except for twenty six Ds, of course. And, and that they were they were only in one, you know, in one orientation. That that box um, the, that box is in awesome shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you might um, be able to sell the box for as much as the whole kit for some. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, yeah, yeah well, one, one shot here, Greg, well, for a motor size thing. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we see those. Okay, so the little guys, these are 13, 13. UOs. Yeah. Then there's two iterations of most of these models. The early 16 Ds were all uh, end bell drive. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's one, this is an old Ruskett. 
Uh, what else we have? Another uh, a Ruskit that's had the can repaint. It's a, a Ruskit 23. And then from four. this iteration, we went to the FT16Ds. And that's the same can size, same dimensions, except a can drive motor. Yep. And as Dennis said, you know, in those days, either it, bolting the can end onto the chassis and or soldering it onto the chassis, which was a much more secure way than two screws through these pretty flimsy little end bells. And then the next size up motors are the 26Ds. And these were great motors. I love these motors, but um, they had sort of similar faults to most of the motors that were given out as, as stock motors in most slot racing kits. The wines were okay. They just had no bloody magnets in them. So they were- The 2060s hard. had the silly ball bearings with no inner race on them where the ball thread spread on the, yeah. spread on the shaft. Yeah, and then um, the ones, yeah, and then the ones on the end here are all, and same thing with the 3060s. They did the 36Ds and then FT uh, 36Ds, and they were all the Canon um, drive ones. And I've I've got some end bell drive ones, but none of them were none around. These have all been. It's a guy in the States who does a hell of a, he does really good work on a lot of old vintage motors. Any I was going to say there's a lot of heavy check motors there. Uh, yeah, the only one that isn't, to be honest, Dennis, is probably this orange picker. Mm -hmm. um, but all of the rest of them are. So. And our, and our br brushes and springs all still available for all of those? Um, well, a lot of... Um, Brushes are, um, 16D brushes are getting harder to find the smaller ones, um, but you can, um, it depends how much work you want to do. You can change the comms and put um, bigger brush hoods um, and bigger brush barrels in. A lot of guys wind their own brush springs so you can get um, brush springs. Any of the vintage brush springs are so old and sort of out of temper, they're not much good. Mm. Um, and there's another thing that's happened too over the years because of uh, the American manufacturers like Mira and Champion and others later on, uh, you know, these days Pro Slot and, and others, uh, they now have handed springs because the, yeah. the spring posts on the motors are both at the top of the motor rather than one yeah. at the top, one at the bottom. Yeah. So uh, you can use... Uh, modern springs on these old motors it just takes two pairs uh to to get one set of springs for a motor um the uh, 3060 brushes are easily available because that's standard size that's used everywhere on modern uh on the modern motors and if you need to go down to 16d size i, I guess you could sit and file them down if you're really mm. worried but here and there on ebay you'll find somebody who still has a stash of them And all of those predate the early, I mean, the, the early motors in my scale electric cars were, I think they were designated RX. Well, the SCX motors are all RX something. Oh, are they? Oh, uh, oh no, sorry, RX I'm wrong, 40. I'm wrong. No, I've, I've realized now some of my scale electric cars had Johnson branded motors. That was it. Yeah, Johnson was a, is a Hong Kong manufacturer. Another manufacturer, who, yeah. Uh, made very similar, and they make... Most of their motors were pretty much the same size, uh, or they fitted in the same places as Mabuchi yeah. motors, because of course they were supplying to other people, not just to the slot car industry. You know, so you need if you're going to supply to uh, automotive guys, you need something that fits the same place as anybody else's yeah. competition yeah. does. So my first scale electric cars were though oh not quite those no that's a is that a Porsche. Uh, no, no, that's uh, again another Japanese car. It's a Marusan, oh, but it has actually got the Johnson Triple Two yeah. motor in it. The, yeah. the that looks like the kind of thing we had. Yeah, the Scale Electric was a smaller one. It was the equivalent of the thirteen UO, but that's it was the, a Triple that's One. The, that's the bigger brother, and there was I think there was a Triple Three, which was thirty six D size, but I haven't seen many of those around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
So my my uh, my first scale electric cars looked a little bit like that, and I think they were called a Panther. They were from the Triang era, late sixties, I think. Yeah. And they had a they had a, a sled chassis where the motor. Uh-huh. I, I can't show you one. I wish I could, but uh, I, that it was that. Who made that motor in that car? Was that a scale electric product, a Mabushi product, or what? Um, all, yeah, scale electric didn't. None of the slot car manufacturers make, make their own. Their own. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it, even that didn't have uh, proper brushes and coil springs like those. It had, uh, you know, the arms with the brushes on that, um, uh-huh. like what's inside an FC one thirty now. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's very very old technology. We haven't progressed at all as far as that's concerned. Well, you could say that the consumer level the fact that the brush the the brushes are encased in the end bell and sealed is a progression from having the open brush gear but i personally like the open brush gear motors Me too. That, uh, you, or you could say it's a fairly hefty regression yep. yeah well you could it could go either way depending on whether you're a consumer or or a hobbyist if yeah. if what have you got there dan um uh, this is a doyusha japanese it seems to be japanese day for me today yeah. Uh, a, do- a Doyusha uh, kit. The chrome wear is still un- you know, unmade up in sitting in the box there. That's the body I got out just to show you what, what, what it was like. Nice. And if I could just indulge what one more, one more. Yeah. Um, n- another, lo- n- another Lotus Ford. Yeah. Um, the, the motor in that looks to be an FT16. The, yeah. Just, a, just yeah. a plain 16. Dude. Plain 16. Yeah, yeah. Plain, yeah, plain 16 with the end bell drive. Yeah. Because they overheat. They used they had those, you know, the nylon brush posts and they, they overheated <laughs> and they would yep. melt. The, the springs yep. would melt into the yep. plastic. So, yep. Um, wow. And yeah. You remember yeah, that you, smell? I think the back of my nostrils <laughs> is still recoiling at the smell. You remember? Yeah. It was the most horrible Acrid smell that that that, it, that those melting end bells put out. Oh, yeah, yeah. terrible. Um, that 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 one I'd never said. I think the only the, where I got the idea of what this may be was from the LA Museum again. Yeah, and I think it's a, a Japanese brand called Yonazawa, Y O N E Z A W A. And and they only ever made two only ever made two models. This and the Porsche 904. So maybe someone could look that up and confirm. Yeah. But it looks very much like it to me. So, yeah. cool. So I, I've never, I, I've never heard of Yonazawa until I picked this up in a, in in a, in a lot with some Scale Extra cars. So, a lot of those manufacturers actually weren't. There's a, there's a ton of manufacturers that were never manufacturers. Um, uh, they just when when you showed um, the Marusan, which is Atlas. Um, they just bought up end of line stuff and repackaged it a lot of it. Uh, or the Atlas was marketed, it was Marusan that was marketed in the States as Atlas. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, I'll hand back over to you, Greg. I've uh, taken enough time. Yeah, <laughs> we've still got to see Greg's show and tell. We haven't even got to that yet. <laughs> see, now I'm going to, uh, my, my show and tell is lame. I don't have awesome. Oh, no, come on. I feel the same. <laughs> okay, I'll do my show and tell. It's almost an hour in. I'll do my show and tell. <laughs> I've got a few things, so I'll just kind of blaze through it. Uh, where is that? Probably not. No, apparently. Yeah. When you're done, John, I'll throw something out here too. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I found yeah, it. that former so, queue. <laughs> you should be yeah. seeing my my new uh, blue and yellow slot car. I've already forgotten ah. the manufacturer. <laughs> But I didn't have any from this manufacturer, uh, and they make a variety of these these old uh, formula cars. And when I saw those, I'm like, okay, well, I got to get at least one of those. So I picked the one that I liked the most for whatever reason. There's like half a dozen uh, March variations, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, variations of this car with, you know, like uh, without this little you know arrow thing in the back and a different with front and a different front. fan and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, I like that one. I'll order that one. I haven't driven Who, it. Who's he in? Who's he in? Isn't that is that Jody's little brother or something? Ian Schechter yes. was Jody's little, was yeah. Jody's little yeah, brother. Was, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, they they both raced. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
he wasn't as good as Jody, but he was a pretty good driver. He was a South African champion a couple of times uh, after after Jody went to Europe. Every day's a learning day. Yep. <laughs> so there's that, and I wanted to do a quick uh, plug plug o Greg's stuff here. Let me switch. There we go. So as I've mentioned before, I do lots of 3D printing. I sell 3D printed products. I designed some crash walls with fences that were inspired by the Ninco uh, crash walls and fences that they no longer nice. sell. Uh, so I 3D print those for people. And the reason this came up is because, because I print everything to order, I can print anything to any color anybody wants, right? So my current order, which I'm currently churning away at, this guy ordered seven sets of walls printed in white with gray fencing and three sets of walls printed in red with gray fencing. And because you can kind of see these sections of the walls, they're designed to bend around whatever curve you need to bend them around. They also cut or split really easily. So he, so I, I expect him to be div divvying up the, the wall sections to make red and white, you know, mm. whatever. I hope, hope to get a picture of that someday. That's nice. Uh, Looks very nice. Yeah, and that's that's this is the this is the early model where I'm literally copying Ninko's fence design. Pretty much everybody wanted a proper chain link design after I showed that. Uh, I think yeah, this is the proper chain uh -huh. link orientation. So this is what I make and sell these days, basically. Uh, but I do all kinds of 3D printing. I do custom controller holders, so you can barely see I I imprint whatever track name or person's name or whatever text they want on the controller holder. Uh, I also do custom uh, driver stations. They're, this is a 124th car. They're big enough for 124th and 132nd cars with numbers and uh, controller ports or whatever. I had a guy, he didn't want to put cards on. Oh, sorry, what? That's, that's ggob.com. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna plug the actual website here in a moment, but yeah, it's, it's my first initial last name, ggaub.com. And then right, you click cool. slot cars. I got all my stuff on my website, but you click slot cars and then you click 3D printed stuff. But I I, I designed these based on a real simple design. And I had a guy not want to put cars there, but have a cup holder. So <laughs> I put a big I put a big hole in it. So that a, a standard solo cup would would fit into the into the thing, and then a number, and that's it. It was basically just somewhere you put your cup, and you and you and he got controller holders and stuff like that. Uh, and you know, I I do all kinds of other stuff. This is a model by somebody else. I, this is one of my prints. You know, it's a multi-piece model, uh, and a variety of stuff. Uh, then I wanted to replug my uh, my track routing stuff because one of my customers sent back pictures of the routing plate that I custom designed. So this is the, the plate installed on his router and it fit perfectly first try. As I mentioned in the past, all he had to do is send me a picture of his router with a ruler on it, you know, nice and straight so I could use that in my CAD program and it fit first try. This is, this is the one with uh, Skelextric on one side and Carrera on the other side for the router spacing. Uh, and he's super happy. As you can see these pictures, he's already putting the routing strip to use. He's, he's already doing the track when he said he got it and, and uh, I asked him for pictures. So he sent me some pictures back for that. Looks cool. Nice. Yeah, and I think, Very nice. I think that's all I wanted to share. Well, that's oh, no. Stuff. Okay. Here's the, here's the wow one. <laughs> okay. Some people will get a wow out of this. So I have not yet printed my 3D printed proxy car yet. I'm working on it because this is what I plan to do. Wow. Oh. <laughs> so I'm printing in color the car, color, the, yeah, the, color the body. 60. So all of that will be printed at the same time. I'm not going to paint it. It's just going to be printed that way. Including the white and the black and the, the numbers Everything. and the whole Everything deal? You see. See, here's the sliced view. And there's my color change. Uh, block. This is done on my multicolor printer. So yeah, it's wow. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Yeah. So zoom in. You can see that's that's all layers. That's all one thing. So I so yeah. I'm not going to use clear for the window screen because 
clear isn't really clear anyways, so I'm just going to do white, so I can just use white for the whole thing. But does it? But it, is there a set of pipes that goes with this? Because all I have is the body. I don't have a chassis or anything. Pretty much all the files that I've seen so far have no engine detail, so we've got to find our own engine. Detail. Okay, I'll just I'll I'm just in, dig something. I'm in the up. same I'm in the same boat right now. Looking dig into the parts box. I won't be. Are you supposed to print it. it? It's got to be printed. Printed yeah, engine I'll, thing. I'll find something and have it printed to you. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and yeah, the that's chassis. I'll probably end up designing the chassis just because I'll just do something simple, just a, just a slab with motor and axle holders and stuff. I printed my chassis yesterday. Yeah, how's it worked yeah. out? It came out great. I've got it in my hand. I can. Oh, your turn. Where box? Am I, am I in? Ah, oh, oh, sorry, sorry Dennis. I'll get to you right next, Phil. All right. Okay, so it's white, so of course it's a it's a yeah, problem. It. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was a it was a, a free fi a free file that I found on either Cults 3D or Thingiverse. I think it's the same one. It was originally for a 908, a Fly 908, mm -hmm. and uh, I I downloaded the file, I pulled it into that Microsoft 3D Builder, and I stretched it. And I took out the, the front end where it had uh, the original two body mounts. And I actually copied the body mounts and put them on the back of the pants, which you can see now there. The back of the pants yeah. mm -hmm. have, the, have the body mounts on them and cleaned up a couple of other things and uh, it printed great. And I'm starting to realize too now that um, some, of the de some of the problems I've been having may well be the filament that I was using because uh, I had been using just the filament that came with my end of with my end of five and then I bought some new filament and this stuff prints so much better. <laughs> I can there, almost there's, see that's moisture. Oh totally. There's there's total totally differences between different types of filament. That oh, look chassis looks on. very nice though. <laughs> Didn't even see you. Going. <laughs> hey I see Paul's in here, yeah. Yep. And, and by the way, those uh, fences that you made, Greg, are great. I have a bunch of those on my track, too. I love people uh, printing their own. I, I love pictures, too. If you, if you, yeah, you, you posted your make. Already. I did. I posted them up on, my, on, the, on the board. Yeah. And on Thingiverse. Yep. Hey, it's good, good to have Paul on here. It's yes, it great. is. We're going to have some yeah, great to hear you. <laughs> so, so for what it's worth, if you guys want some engine detail stuff, just send me an email. I've got a I'll couple of things I'll send you. Some of them just... work. Some of them are specifically for different cars. In fact, uh, hang on. I just hadn't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> I'll even bother to turn my turn my camera on and peel off my security tape here. There you go. I don't know if you can see that. Pull it back towards your face a little. There you go. Well, that looks nice. That's T a Lola T163 okay. that I just pulled off the printer tonight. Nice. And I took the windows off of it so that I can make a buck and actually put some glass on. But the wings ah, come with high, it. High wing and all. Yep. Cool. Cool, cool. So there's there's some other files. I'll go ahead and send them if you guys want them. Just don't send me an email. Yep, it. will do. All right, Phil, go ahead and show off your stuff while I take care of this noise. Okay. All right, so guys, check this out. I'm over in a, I'm about 40 miles from my house. And I, I helped the guy with his TrackMate software. Some of you probably know what that is. So he's got TrackMate. He's a he's a HO guy, but I have a small HO track next to my 132nd scale. So I came out here to take a look. So I'm just going to give you a quick walk around his room, and then I'm going to show you a couple of really cool builds that he did in 32nd scale where he handmade some sprint cars. The guy does body work. So, you know, you can imagine a body work guy that's really meticulous. So I'm going to just flip this camera around first and show you uh, what's going oh, wow. on here. So you know, you're going to notice some nice cues here in this room. Obviously, you know, he's got some displays here. He's got his TrackMate software. He's got some nice, you know, slot car boxes that are full of lots of pieces. A lot of these bodies, he's made himself. He's a casting guy, John Kit. 
So he, he does the Illumilite uh, casting system. Uh, so he's doing that stuff. But if you look around, this is a, a little slot car paradise. But some of the stuff I thought was really cool is you got a guy over there that says fire rescue on his back. That guy is, his name is Tim. And Tim is a fire chief, right? But Tim has a table that will do a four by eight sheet of uh, routing. And so he's doing some really awesome routing stuff. And I told him, Tim, you just need to do a survey and find out if any guys want stuff like, see the sideboard here? Now, if you look at this sideboard, you can see my finger goes right inside of there because that's all routed out lettering, nice routed out deal there. So there's the one of the tracks that, that he's routed out some stuff, right? So, and obviously any material he can put on that routing table, he can do some really nice stuff. So I was just really impressed with all the detail that he's done. Uh, some of the really awesome stuff he's put together. You know, you talk about uh, controller stands, you know, he's done these guys uh, kind of like John was doing. But uh, Greg, there's a, there's a really cool, another type of controller holder, right? Sticks up like yours does. Um, hey, uh, John, uh, John Babbitt, turn your sign on, will you? Yeah. So he did that stuff. And then he did this. This is done from a router, a table router. I don't know if you can see the lettering there. Yeah. Wow. Turn this on. And uh, when he turns this on, you'll get another idea. Yeah. I'm sure it goes real nice. I, I, I love the name of the track. Yeah. <laughs> Peter's Paradise. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, T-Jet Speedway. So, there we oh, go. there you go. Oh, oh yeah. wow. Yeah, there you cool. color. Can, you, can you give me some cycles, some colors for me? It's going to be kind of hard, guys, with obviously with a phone. But uh, if you start looking at what he uh -huh. does, and you can see the coloration here. Cool. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? But it's all etched from his, that's all etched from a computerized routing table. So it's obviously if you wanted something like a big sign like this, this guy, uh, Tim Smith, the fire chief, we'll go to fire chief Smith and we'll tell him, hey, we want a really nice, uh, you know, glass or acrylic etched sign with a light box underneath it. And this is stuff obviously you can't do very well in 3D printing because of the size format's not there yet. Hey, right? what are you so, trying to say? <laughs> no, I'm just saying, you know, this saying. is like, you know, size matters, you know. So every tool, every tool right, has its own purpose. This, you know, sometimes you can do it an inch at a time and it works out pretty good for you. And sometimes you just got to go all 12 inches all at the same time. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. But you know what? I can do things on my 3D printer he can't do on his router. Yeah, there's yeah, there's things he can't do, but I, I really just got here. I've never met these guys before, but he does these routed tracks. These could be, you know, 30-second scale. They could be HO scale. Um, just so, really so, nice. So, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but uh, Phil, did he route that track using the, the, the same router? He's, he's Yep, he's done the same router. This is not a handheld router. This is a big robotic table thing. Yeah, and he can do it four by eight sections if you want, and then obviously cut it, you know, so that it, it doesn't take the whole, uh, so it doesn't obscure the, the, the table underneath. So, yeah, he's routing tracks. He, this thing is really crazy cool. Um, I'm going to just take you over here and show you. Here's a neat idea. If you've got a light bridge for your analog mode, right, he's done this really cool um, light bridge cover. And it, that those LEDs turn different colors based on the state of the track. So when the guys stop, you, you shut it down and it goes red. The LEDs oh, do. Tim, Look, Tim, uh, you've got all kinds of stuff there. So you can yellow flag and get different color LEDs and stuff. But I, what I wanted to show you real quick, I'll, I'll share my screen and I'll just show you a couple things that he did um, that, that I just took some pictures of. So let me just... Uh, I'm doing this all for my phone, guys, so I really apologize for the messiness here. But uh, he had this kit, and I thought that this was pretty cool. This monogram, monogram kit is actually uh, 100, you know, 124 scale. 
but the kit was just beautifully done. And if you look over, let me see if I can back out of here now. And uh, I want to go back and, oh, I just blew that. <laughs> let me get back to my Zoom chat. My apology. Uh, come on, Phil, we paid good money for this presentation. <laughs> yeah, I know, and I'm I'm blowing it here. So I want to show you, hang on, I'll stop this share, and I'll pop over and share another photo for you. And uh, what's really significant here, um, let me see if I, can, if I can show you this thing. I'm not sure if I can show this as a video or not. Um, yeah, videos are risky. Yeah, I can't do it on mobile screen sharing. That's okay. Look, oh, those cars are gorgeous. Hey, if you know, can you see the springs on the front end of this thing here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those are ballpoint pin springs, and the suspension works, guys. <laughs> right? So he's got, he, and this is all hand built. There's no kit here, there's nothing. This guy just builds these himself. And uh, you really get a look at some of the stuff that he's doing. And I just thought, man, what a talented guy. Now, these are 130 second scale, these, these sprint cars. Uh, you know, they just happen to be sitting on top of that monogram uh, kit because he took me back in his back room and said, hey, man, let me show you a couple more things. So I just thought that was really cool. Um, I did do one other quick little thing here. Um, I started working on a little bit on my track to do a little bit more with the diorama type stuff. So I did a couple snapshots here and uh, I just did this, uh, this little section here with the trees. Uh, that, that dark Is that your feet? That's your Fiat, Phil. That's my Fiat, that's my little 124. Uh, so I've got a couple of those and, uh, you know, I really got a kick out of, out of doing some of this stuff, but I, I you know, after seeing, um, um, was it Garth last week that did his, his track, right? I saw his stuff and I thought, you know what, I, I got to step my game up because these guys got awesome looking tracks and I'm looking, I got a tacky track and I need a, one of these sexy looking tracks like these other guys got. So I started working on this stuff. And uh, I built myself some, you can see the scenery hills back there, uh, a little in the foreground, a little in the background there. So you just start getting an idea um, that I'm starting to work my way through it. I still got to put down the grass mat for everything else, but uh, that's kind of what I got, guys. And uh, I just thought, you know what, let me, let me hop out here and give you guys a quick little taste of what I'm doing. But I just thought, man, look at this guy. Look at this guy's display cases. And I mean, he's got, you know, just everywhere you go, there's stuff like this. And the guy's got everywhere you go. You wow. know? So it's just a cool room. Um, it's inspiring to see it. Uh, you know, I mean, like, like there's a, there's a one-to-one -one car. Uh, he's got, you know, oh, his son built this uh, engine dyno, and they've got the engine up there. His son built an engine dyno to dyno a V8, one-to-one V8 engine. I'll repeat that. His son <laughs> built this model, and the guy who owned the one-to-one -one car sanctioned it. And uh, so there's just a lot of cool stuff that these guys are doing that I just thought, man, I'm a, I've moved I just I'm visiting the big leagues here. Oh never mind. He, he's got a he's got a car model magazine uh frame there as well. I see that on the yeah. wall. Yeah. Hey. Oh he's one of he's one of us. One of Absolutely. us. Absolutely. That's a car I built right there. It was in car model. I built it in 72 and won the hopper race with it. And there it is right there yeah. still. Here's here's the car that he won. Uh the race in, in his uh in 72. Oh. And car model ran the article so that's why this thing is framed up like that so he's got a little notoriety there and a little mutton chops there too if you take a look at them babies right there mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he looks like he looks like a he looks like a regular jackie stewart there yeah. yep yep well he looks just like jackie stewart today yeah just older jackie's <laughs> dead eh? <laughs> well, doesn't look that old okay okay i'm, I'm going to look at the bodies He's made himself and uh, painted them up. The guy paints all these 
and uh, he's done wheel flares on HO cars. I'm going, holy Toledo, you flared the wheel wells on this HO car? You know how much detail work that is? Oh, here's how he mocks it up, right? And then he grinds that front end down. Where's that? And then here's the Mustang when it's done, right? Oh, cool. That with no front air dam there with just that a piece of stuff. On the and then he grinds it and puts the ground effects and everything into the bodywork. So wow. pretty cool stuff, you know, just doing some neat. I'm, I'm seeing some stuff you could do in our scale as well that just look really slick. So you can see he's got a sign over there running. I want like a 15 foot size of that. I want a four by eight sheet sign like that <laughs> that I can replace the sheet of drywall in my basement wall, right? So just cool stuff, guys. I just want to give you a look uh, just to some of the stuff that's happening. Yeah. And then we got, you know, we we do have out here for our, our uh, visceral, uh, uh, for your visceral pleasure, you got him over there doing the slot car dance when he's racing. I don't know if you saw that little ditty bop he does when he's running his car. Yeah, so he that's probably doesn't want you to film that. Um, just I'm just saying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he took the well, skirt off. If you still had a skirt on, this would be really exciting. <laughs> but he gave that up. You're gonna have to drink something harder, Greg, for that to be attached to be attractive to you. Oh, so I'm, it's pretty I'm, cool stuff. It's already looking, in there, still not working. Look at, you know, looking back at your at your share there, um, that greggob.com, I can see I'm gonna be on there right quick. Um because be aware, that fits for anybody who's up. going for anybody who's going to ggalb.com beware there are things that i was have been interested in for the last 30 years on there it's like yeah. a site that i've made since the internet began so it's all there sure <laughs> but well, yeah click on slot cars and, and then you'll see the slot car related stuff all right cool so that yeah that'd be pretty awesome so those uh those fences and walls, I could, I know I can use some of that. So uh, as I try to do something with this track, so I'm gonna have to hit you up with lickety split. <laughs> so pretty cool stuff. Well, I'm just gonna let Tim take this out with his little dance. Um, <laughs> see, oh, don't get better than that right there. That's All right, Roll your dollars up guys and get ready because <laughs> Tim's going at it over there. But uh, he's he's gonna, see, just see, let him know. I say roll the dollars up, he gets let him going know. right away because he needs slot car money. Send money. All right, Phil. It's, 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 a, good thing, it's a good thing he's not in right. Canada because we'd be throwing coins. Let him know that he's not out of the ordinary. I, I think we all know somebody like that in, in a club or two. Uh, yeah, so he's definitely not alone. Yeah, everyone's got their little. Uh, I'm in the I'm in the rhythm on the track, and I got my little ditty bop that helps me make those corners. So yep. it's always it's fun to see a guy. Well, thanks. So that's, that's very much for sharing. Guys. Thanks for sharing where yep. you're at, Phil, and sharing all that guy's stuff. And tell them to join the chat at some point in the future. Uh, yeah. I know that Luff had something to show previously, and he's been sitting patiently. Luff, did you want okay. to do your little uh, him. that you had prepared before? I'm gonna, mute. I'm gonna mute you. There you go. Luff, can you hear me? Yeah. Did you want to do your slideshow that you you had prepared? Oh, uh, sure. Go ahead. Um, let's see if I can find it. So for those who don't already know, who haven't been paying any attention over the last several episodes, Luff is Old Slot Racer, oldslotracer.com. He is the man from whom I took over uh, through after Jeremy uh, taking over the, uh, the the manufacturer and retail of the Old Slot Racer Wood Slot, route, wood slot Track Routing Toolkit. Uh, so this is the man who pretty much came up with it all. And of course, oldslotracer.com is a fantastic resource just to spend days looking at fantastic routed tracks of all kinds all over the world from people who have sent in pictures um, over the years. Was that showing up? Yeah, go ahead and talk about that. Um, it was people saying that they don't have room for a track or, you know, they, they just don't have the time to build them and stuff like that. So I 
decided I was just going to experiment with four by eight foot trucks, wood trucks. And this was the first one. And it was just like a single lane, um, you know, parking lot kind of autocross truck. So I just pretty much random. I routed that. Um, trying to get as much running room into a four by eight, you know, without crowding it too much. And then uh, that's with it painted to make it look like a parking lot. Um, so lot, how much running, uh, linear running room is there? I, I don't remember, probably around 38 or 40 feet. Wow. Per yeah, lot. At least. It, goes back, feet looking. it goes back and forth along the length a couple of times and then zigzags in the middle. So I would say, yeah, probably, yeah. probably upwards of 40 feet. And uh, just a little bit of Mickey Mouse scenery. And then the, this is the wiring for the, the crossovers. What do you call those saddle taps or something like that? I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I think I've seen a name for them at some point, but it's, it's where you basically, you put, you kind of route a little divot in the, in the wood and then you yeah. put the tape down into the divot and then you solder the wire in the divot so that it's still smooth over the top. It ends up flush. Yeah. And I, I like having all my solder joints up on top of the truck just for maintenance and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't like crawling around under the table. Mm -hmm. um, this was the little control boxes that we had, just a direction switch and a, a plug for a controller. And I think we probably used an Inco power pack for power supply for this thing. And then... Uh, once it was done, we ran it for a while and then I gave it to a hobby shop and they, they had it in there for their customers. So that was it. See, it's it's super easy. You don't even have to have a plan. I mean, you you, you know, in, in his previous pictures, you saw the routing strip nailed in there. Yeah. You, know, you just threw that onto the wood, pounded well, the took... nails in, right? <laughs> I, I went in on, sorry? I was gonna say, how long did that take you to do, Luff? Uh, seven hours. <laughs> yeah, from start went, to finish with paint and everything, right? I went in uh, on a Saturday morning and I had it at this stage by four o'clock. Wow. So just, just to, I don't know, just to see if it's possible. You know, it, it would take longer for some of us to assemble plastic track. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot like the one that Dennis made. I, I was interested to know what's the what's the tire grip like like on the copper tape. Sorry, I was interested to know what's the tire grip like on the copper tape. I, I'm sorry, my ears are bad. Uh, I heard does the copper tape. Does the copper tape cause the tires to slip? No, no. It's uh, it's the thinnest copper tape you can get. It's a one mil. So there's, there, you can hardly feel the edge of it, and yeah, it lasts it forever. Make a lot of difference. Yeah, the, the 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 paint is what makes the most difference for your grip, and yeah. generally speaking, when you're doing uh, just a wood, a simple wood router track like that, you're you're just throwing on the cheapest latex house paint, emulsion type paint, flat or satin maybe, but not gloss. And then you just got tremendous grip. You don't even need to rubber it in. It's got so much grip. And the, and you don't notice that the copper tape has negligible effect on the performance of the car. It's all about the paint. Mm -hmm. No, no Look, more, no less. I've, than... I've, I've got a question for... Go on. Sorry. Go ahead, I've got a question for I've got a question for Luff and Dennis. I noticed that in the tracks I've seen you both build in the past, you've both used... Uh, You've both done the lane color marking by painting the base of the slot and the area underneath the braid. Was it in your case, Dennis? Does uh, is it beneficial to paint the slot, or is, is that going to wear away quite quickly when the guide gets in there and gets to work? I, actually, I never paint the slot. You never paint the slot. No, no I do. I paint the slot always. Um, I I feel that I like to have the the MDF sealed. And uh, I found that the, the, uh, 
grayed attaches better to a painted surface because I'm using that double-sided tape. Uh, and, you know, you, the braid is recessed. It's unlike Luffs where the tape is on top. On the top, So you're, yeah. putting the, you're sticking the tape down onto the paint. Uh, so I needed to paint the, the, the recesses of the, where the braid is. Um, so I just went ahead and painted the whole thing and yeah. painted it in the lane colors on my, on my three-lane track. Well, um, based on the fact that I watched your video where you showed your track, I've got a friend who's doing a wood track right now yeah. and he was wondering how to do the lane color uh, indications. And I said to him, well, how much of the surface of the, how much of the surface that you're fastening the braid to is a visible once the braid is in place. And he said, well, there's about half a millimeter, one millimeter each side of the slot. And I said, well, if you just paint the slot, I'm sure that'll be more than enough. Yeah. Well, you know, when you, when you do this, if you're using quarter inch braid, uh, you've got a one eighth inch slot and you recess with a three quarter inch uh, recessing tool. So mm. that what that does is it gives you the, the slot in the middle and then each side about a 16th of an inch before the braid starts. Mm. And then the yeah. braid goes all the way out to the edge of the recess. So well, you is that have is... the one eighth and the two sixteenth pieces. So you've got yeah. a quarter of an inch there, uh, an eighth of an inch there. And it's plenty. Yeah. You could see it easily. Well, he had a he had a test piece manufactured for him, uh, uh, machine routed, CNC routed, and it's only uh, four lanes and a, and about a foot and a half long. And he's 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 painted that. He's experienced the MDF went furry the first layer of paint. He said it all picked up, and then he subsequently used uh, I think the brand is Leyland um, um, paint, and I think he's used that because other tracks in the local area have used it. So he's used something similar to what his customers are familiar with if you like and it's for a commercial track but this was the this was the sample piece he's in the process of doing the paintwork right now but he keeps showing us his updates and progresses cool. uh, my involvement with this, the, the worldwide slot car chat has led to this background knowledge and he's now he's now benefiting from the fact that i've watched <laughs> so yeah we're in the process of building a wood in, in, to replace a scale electric sport digital I, I don't have a whole lot of experience with racing on tracks that have that have the that have the slot and the braid recess painted i've primarily raced on tracks that either have no lane coloring whatsoever or they have a stripe right alongside the slot i've seen that too the yeah braid. the problem that i've had on those is that uh, the particular track owner uh wanted the rubber you know to be deposited right and so you end up with a nice rubbered in track which is fantastic but then you have loss of color in, in a lot of those turns especially in the turns where the car is sliding a little bit and then mm. you have and this was an eight lane track so so you had to come up with additional colors you didn't you didn't have the six primary and secondary you had to toss in some other colors which was like purple and black and on this There's standard color, for that isn't there it is, yeah, and purple and black. You just when it got rubber, when it got rubbered over, you could not tell the difference between purple and black. So yeah. it was always, you know, <laughs> I was I was too new to know that this was always purple and this was always black, etc. So I'm like, which one? I don't know what lane to put it in. <laughs> are they the two? Are they the two gutter lanes, purple and black? No, uh, purple and black are right together, and uh, black are they? is usually the very inside lane, and purple. Oh, you see, out I, I know there's a commercial, the, the the king tracks and the commercial mm -hmm. tracks. They all have this, and I've I've listened to people Red, having conversations white, about that. Green, orange, blue, yellow, purple, black. We it's always race uh, crash and burn, so we don't do any marshalling. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why we don't worry about colors. But for the tracks that do marshalling. Uh, yeah. Dennis or anybody else, obviously, d do you think that uh, colors in the recess and the slot are are more long lasting than colors on the track surface? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. And I think also for the from a visual point of view, uh, it's not if you're looking for like I did with my home track, where I'm looking for a slightly more realistic look than a full-blown commercial track, then putting mm -hmm. this, putting the colors in the slot just tones that whole thing down a little. Yeah. Oh. And that's the other reason I like the colors in the slots. Chris is agreeing. Do you have anything to add, Chris? No, I mean, I, I took mine a step <clears throat> further. I don't, I don't have a, a I, on the latest track I did, I just put a series of 
uh, colored dots on latex paint, just a dot every four or five feet around the thing. And you, when you know where to look, you can see them for replacing cars, but they're substantially less intrusive than painting the, um, painting the slot, which is not bad. You know, all the commercial tracks have a quarter inch color strip on either side of the slot. It looks like a rainbow. It looks like mm. some futuristic thing. It doesn't look like a track at all. So it looks it looks like a commercial slot car track, man. Well, yeah, but yeah. so there's so your Mike Wayne. Mowers seems Mike Mauer seems to have left uh, is left from viewing his in his uh, camera. <laughs> Well, he's in trouble this week for, uh, with me, and so is Phil, uh, because my show and tell for this week is a new car. Oh, okay. ah, and it's, like it's Mike Mauer's fault, because he showed one of these off uh, oh, yeah. a week or so ago, and he said, uh, these run really well. So I looked them up. I looked at the Pendle Slot Racing website to find out the ins and outs that I like to know, things like the track width and the body weight and all that kind of thing, the roof height. And I decided that I'm going to give one of these a go. And the reason that Phil is in trouble is because he suggested a few weeks ago that if you need a set of spares for a car, you need to buy two. <laughs> and so I've bought two. <laughs> so that's you two, a bad influence, officially. That's the Aston Martin Vantage, right? Yeah. That's well, the Aston Martin Vantage GT3. Oh, it's gorgeous. Uh, in flat paint of all things, which you mentioned in there, and it's interesting. It's 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 not unpleasant, but yeah, um, I love this is going to go up. Paint. It's going to go up against the AMG Mercedes GT3. Uh -huh. Now the this car has been modelled by Scale Electric in the past, and when you look at the difference between, I've driven one, and it goes sort of nearly very good, but not quite as good as the AMG. And when you look at the difference between the previous one and this one, uh, there's a couple of significant differences that I think are the key differences. And in one in particular is the fact that the track width across the front axle is wider on this model. And the body weight is slight, uh, the roof height is slightly lower, I think. But uh, yeah, so that's, that's this week's nice isn't, car. Show isn't, and tell. Isn't that, isn't the previous version in a sidewinder and that is an inline? Yes, yeah, that's that right. That's a major yes. difference right there. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. They're going to perform completely. One should run better than the other, should it not? But the, I'm afraid that the, the, uh, the AMG is still way better than the old yeah, Sidewinder true. version of this. Now, now Wayne, you, you said that you heard me when I said uh, buy two. But yeah. I, think you, I think you didn't hear me when I gave you my address so you could have the second one drop ship to my house. <laughs> you got to pay more attention. You've got enough of these already. <laughs> uh, this, is plus plus. this is probably car number nine and ten in my collection right now. I mean, the, all the, all of my stuff that I've currently got is is modern stuff. Uh, all my childhood stuff is gone, and that's another story for another show. But well, all I can say, Wayne, is that you need to buy more. Yeah. Nah. Helps nah, nah, nah. Industry. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy to get too many and not be able to focus on getting to uh, getting one of them running really, really well. There's no such thing as too many slot cars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. I see it all over the forum. Yeah, the rule is n plus one. N yeah. plus one. There's always there's always another one out there to buy. As I, I've slowed down quite a bit on my slot car buying, and I'm still buying slot cars. Yep. No, no well, these were these were really these were really inexpensive. If you notice, they're not in a box. So uh, oh, they came this is how that. it came to me. Yeah, and I got a deal for buying two. I actually got three pound off the whole thing for buying two. And I got both of these for 57, 56. Yeah, and that, that's, what we're that's what we're trying to tell you. It's not what you spend, it's what you save. Yeah, yeah it's what you save. Yeah, the that's more you about. buy, the more you save, right? Just say that it was yeah, on yeah. sale. <laughs> <laughs> Well, un until they were on sale, it was just an it just an investigation into whether or not I think that's going to be competitive in the Scale Electric GT3 standard class, which runs in one of my clubs. And interestingly, I looked on the Facebook this week, and one of my notifications on there was that the um, the club organizer has also bought this car, <laughs> <laughs> and he's the guy. He's the guy I can't yet beat. 
So, have you uh, done much that, to it yet, Wayne? Pardon? Have you done much to it? No, I've taken it out of the packet, and I actually just unwrapped the second one in front of your eyes. So, uh, no, all I've done, I've not even had time to throw a vernier around on it. Um, but it will get it'll get torn down, and it'll get fuel laps on a little test track I've built in the attic, and then it'll go to the club once we can start racing again. I mean, they did resume activities in the summertime. I didn't go along, but now we're all we're all fully locked down again. And your club, you you run with magnets, is that correct? No, this is a wood track. It's my first and only wood track experience. Um, it's the North Wales Slot Car Club. It's about um, 40 minutes drive from me. I must have been there for the first time just over a year ago. And I think I've been there a total of 10 times so far. Well, you, um, you'll, so, prob you'll probably... Uh, soon have to learn about tire chewing and tire oil. Oh, no, I don't need to learn about that. I know all about that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's no, it's nothing new. And, and like I said to you, this, I said to you in my slot intro last week that what's, what's RC sort of car, what's RC sort of car, car racing sets yeah. you up well for doing slot car racing. Uh, I'll be putting, um, well, I'll be putting slotted N22 on that. And what sort of a tire tour do you have? I have the German Reifenschleifen thing then. Okay. <laughs> the Reifenschleifen. <laughs> yeah. The one, like one, the Area 3 tire razor axle. It's, it, yeah. That's the one. It's the one. Yeah, that's the one. I, it's something I've never owned. And ever since I went to the wood track, I mean, I've, I've managed because I've used a power track and a piece of sandpaper and literally sat there with the finger on the controller until the controller gets hot and and the motor in the car gets hot doing the tires on uh, on on the track and 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 that was good enough to start with but it's it's stressful on the equipment the motor in the car the controller and i thought to myself well i need to get the kind that i can get the axle out the car without taking the wheels off because i'm aware mm -hmm. of all the problems of taking the wheels off and that that led me directly to the tire razor but i just couldn't find one for sale and there was more than i wanted to spend so i've spent the last Oh, 10 months with my eye on the market, just casually waiting for one to come up, come along. And then this one came along and it was only, I was only in Liverpool about 30 miles away. So I jumped on the opportunity and I, uh, and that was my Christmas present to self. Good for you. Best money along you with the controller. <laughs> because I mean, I've been, I've, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm learning wood. I'm learning wood track uh, uh, cars now. And I'm starting with these things. I've got a couple of pot, uh, potted cars. In fact, one of my, probably my best car uh, at the track at the moment is a Fly Racing uh, 911 Evo. It's mm -hmm. a very popular common one. It's very old. I think it was one of the first cars they produced. But I've now got another one of those, with a e, which is an Evo 3, which has got a pod in it. So I've yet to prepare that. Uh, but I'll be I'll be taking that to the club. I keep losing in that category to a car with a pod. So, it, wait, um, so the club that's is that, letting, the club is letting you race fly cars that are fly no, no, cars wait. with pods against fly cars with no pods. Yeah, the category is fly. The fuck? So you can you you can run nearly anything. So there's a lot of people running the Porsche 911. Well, no shit. Well, the, what, just, the, just, just out of interest, Greg, probably my three quickest cars do not have motor pods in them, and they're all plastic shells. I mean, but when you're also when you're talking about a fly, though, there's so much work that has to be done. To, well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But and you I've done it by racing potted car out of the box, and those things are friggin' rockets. They can be. I yeah. mean, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna flip a coin. On a on a solid chassis fly versus a fly racing fly. Yeah. Well, my fly racing, I've got two, and they're both they're both the same body shell, the fluorescent yellow version of the 911. But one is a fly racing Evo two. I've got the boxes for both, and the other one is an Evo three, and the Evo three is the one with the pod in it. And I didn't realize that there was a podded version until I came across one in person, and I went, "That's what I thought I should." That's what I thought. Of. That's what I should have, thought I should have bought. And in fact, I've got this flat car, which is an Evo two. Well, now that you got the tire chewer, you might be good. Oh, it, it's it's you know still the best car, right? 
it, I mean, the reason it's it's as good as it is is because the the track is quite large and that motor is quite juicy compared to an FC one hundred and thirty. Yeah. They don't have a motor. These things, <laughs> these, things the, these things, they make you run uh, because it's wood and copper tape. It's not. It doesn't matter whether you've got the magnet in, but they do make you run the stock uh, Mabushi five hundred and forty. Uh, Mabushi eighteen hundred RPM in there. So. Well, at least they've got a motor spec. Then that's good. <laughs> Well, they've what got five the, categories. Of, I was going to say, but still, if you have a category that, that encompasses multiple categories, it might as well just be an open class, you know? No, no, no. They've, they've, they've actually got five, five car classes, and I don't own a car for every one of those classes, but they always allow you to run what you've run. Oh. So if you run what you've run and you, qual you don't qualify for the, for the main finals, for the category finals, you just run for the, you, you know, you run for the fun. Okay. So That's I can go cool. and test. Uh, a car that's um, got something different about it, like it doesn't matter what it is. Um, any week of the, any day of the week, you know, any week of the season when it's open. That's cool. So I've run my uh, AMG GT3 there, and I can regularly now get that on on scale electric GT3 night. I can get that into second position. Uh, I've just uh, earned my way into the top heat, shall we call it that, so that I experience less other cars that are off for any reason or in a marshal's hand so now it gets easier for me to do the quick qualifying times and uh, like i say I've, I, I've spent some time making my way up the category up that category and i'm now like i say in the into the into the top heat i've done that also with my fly car they also have three other categories and on those nights i just run one of the either the fly or the scale electric just so that i'm learning <laughs> It's a good club. It's, it's, it's yeah, nice, that's, nice that's, that's really cool that they that, that you can just kind of come in and you know as long as you're well they, they they do one of these categories each week and they rotate the five, so every fifth week you'll be running the same car unless you've changed or, or, or done something to it. So there's plenty of time to, you know, fiddle and and and, uh, and make changes between events. And that's if you're doing, that's if you're doing the on category every every week. Do they make you run the cars very stock? Or can you start changing yeah. out guides and things like that? Well, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure. I've not seen a lot of people changing guides. I think the rules on one of these is that you must retain everything about the car except the rear tires. Okay. So that's weight is allowed. That's the other thing. One of the things that I always do with a scale extra car, the very first thing I do is I take out that little screw that holds the that holds the guide, the one that goes down in the guide post. Right, you know, it's a little screw with the with yeah. the washer that's kind of part of the head of built the into it. Yeah, yeah. Right. When you take that out, if you look at the if you look at the guide as it comes up through the chassis, it yeah. leaves, there's about uh, yes, a, it's maybe high. half a millimeter of that post comes right through. Yeah. I yeah. turn that off. Yeah, me too. And then and then when you put the screw back, you can actually tighten that whole thing up. You could if, yeah, if you go too far, you could tighten up completely so that the guide itself won't even rotate. And then you back it off just a little until it until it rotates nicely without any of that yeah. that yeah. slop that it has, and uh, that works well. Um, and that's the slop. Yeah, that's what you want to get rid of. Yeah. 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 That's horrible. So there's two yeah. ways of doing it. Either you cut the top of that off, or you put about a twenty-five thousandths thick, like a quarter millimeter washer, uh, underneath. But sometimes, yeah. sometimes that will pull the front wheels off the off the track, depending on the track. And well, this this is this is all the what I call blueprinting. It's it's getting the original car to work the way it was originally intended. The uh, way we want it to work. The way we want it. What? The way we think it should be intended. Yeah. 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 It works just <laughs> fine for Scalextric's opinion. Yeah, especially if there's magnets involved. <laughs> yeah. Well, before we get well, yeah. into into Skelectric tuning for your Who's specific, that? You know, oh, no. I, I wanted to I wanted to give Stephen here a chance. I don't think Stephen has been on before. Stephen, have you been on before, Mr. Lander? No, I haven't. No, we're gonna put you on the I'm spot. Just, then uh, you're gonna have to, this evening, really. You're 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 stuck, man. You're gonna have to tell us your slot related history. Sucks to be you. Oh. I've, uh... I, I, I'm here at the request of my brother more than anything. I, I believe he's got something prepared for this evening. Oh, so, is this uh, Wayne's yeah. brother? All so right, let's do it. Both of you, go for it. Surprise, surprise. Um, 
I did mention that I'd bring Stephen along if I could, and, and here he is. So, uh, should we have what Stephen I... start or should we have Wayne start? That's the question. Maybe we should have Stephen start because Wayne, you started last time, and maybe the story will be slightly different. Yeah, it could be. Stephen, why don't you go ahead and start your slot related history, and then Wayne can maybe jump the, in. Maybe the story will be true this time, Greg. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've not really heard Wayne's. We don't want you to have heard it. We want you to tell it your, your, how you tell it. <laughs> uh, so, obviously, it's going to be very similar. Brought up in the same household. Um, as far back as I can remember, uh, I know we had some old circuit, the Triang stuff, a couple of old metal-bodied... Uh, we had a blue thing with some lights on, a bit like... Um, Aston Martin, DB something or other, and a green one. I remember the U-steer cars, but by the time I was aware of them, they'd had their steering wheel and the, and the special guide blades removed. That's great, um, yeah. I can remember some old Cooper cars. I remember some cars that got motors in from trains. Um, That's the motor I was many, talking many about Christmases earlier. Yeah, many Christmases we had uh, the same model but in a different colour each. So we had the slot where the uh, uh, stock cars that used to spin and go the opposite direction. Uh, we had motorbike and sidecars that were never really handled very well, but they were good to drive. Um, I remember having lorries. a four guy truck. And, hey, the lorries. Yeah, we had lorries. We had all sorts of stuff, but yeah, a lot of it to squabbling over who gets which colour and swapping it before we'd even open the box. I want the yellow one! Kind of stuff. Um, a lot of it was playing just as selves at home. Um, rightly, as Wayne said, it would a, a periodic thing that we'd get out, obviously, around the Christmas time. We have done uh, some competitive element uh slot car racing with ho there uh, we go I, I only did it i think for a year because my main hobby uh has remained uh, rc car racing um i've done that at all kinds of levels for a long time now um but uh, i i've dipped my toe in the water of the competitive element of slot car uh, certainly with ho scale uh, and I've done some 24-hour events uh, with that on the eight-lane uh, circuit that Dork, DH, uh, Derby HO Racing Club have. Steve. Um, yeah. Can I share the screen and put some photos of that? You, you can go through your bit in a bit, yeah. But, yeah, that's well, pretty much it. Um, that is what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I was in a model shop in two thousand three. Like Wayne, pick it up from here. Yeah, this, that, that's what I. This is this is our comeback to slot cars, isn't it? Because the uh, the the, t the toys we had as children pretty well went away in about the late eighties when we started RC car racing. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't come out again after that. I don't think until the day I took you to this slot car club. Yeah. Um, I was in a model shop because uh, I was a rep in the model industry in, in the early 2000s, repping RC cars and products like that. And I was in a model shop in Derby, and I saw a poster for the Derby HO Racing Club. And that's, I hope you can see my share screen at the moment, yeah? Well, the Derby HO Racing Club is probably Britain's biggest, I'm going to say. Certainly, uh, it's been around since 1992. And this is the kind of scene that we were greeted with when we got there. Now, I don't know if you can recognize the circuit layout there, but it's a real circuit. And all their tracks are real circuits. This one is Donington Park, which is a Derby-based circuit. So you've got the main start straight, red gate corner, the craner curves, the old hairpin. And in this one, on this variant, it's got so the the Melbourne track. Loop included. So the club runs 26 real circuits every year, but they have a book of circuits 
and in in the book are circuits past and present and um this is another typical club scene i don't actually you know where is this track this is this is in Talagos. In Talagos. In Talagos, as it used to be. And if you remember in Talagos, it had kind of a double lap with the main straight and a, and a repeat main straight. Is anybody aware of that? Just slide back from No, it, the, 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 the real, uh, the, the centre S is at the front end of the main straight now. It's the one, uh, they come up the hill, don't they, from the, from the bottom of the track and they come around uh, over the main straight, and then they now go through the centre S. Well, the centre S is here. It links the old circuit to the... It links the outer to the inner uh, of the old circuit. So the, it, it effectively had two laps per lap, the Interlagos circuit, in its, in its early days. So, yeah, anyway, this is the HO Racing Club in Derby, and at this point, it's taking place in what's called the refreshment room. And this stands next to, or stood, I don't know if the building's still there, next to a crown green bowling alley, a, a crown green bowling pitch in the Derby Rolls-Royce Sport and Leisure Facility in Derby City Centre. And I don't know whether you can see, but I'm actually in that photo. I didn't realise I was, but because of the date, it's about right. I should be. There I am. You weren't there that day, Stephen, by the look of things. No, but the club no. has a regular attendance of about 20 to 30 people, and you can see the way they mark their lane colors. We've just been discussing lane colors. Every piece of uh, Tommy AFX track has a uh, little mark, little paint marks at the ends of its, of its lanes, and um, this, like uh, this club's tracks run, um. They run once per year, typically, but they've got way more than 26 tracks in their books, so it can take about three or four years for a track to come back around on the calendar. And when it does come back around on the calendar, you'll actually be running a different car to the one you ran on it when you ran it last. And that's because when you enter this club, you basically buy two cars. Oh, there's another one. Suzuka, Japanese Suzuka. Grand Prix. Yeah, here's the picture of Suzuka. And this section, I've just worked out this afternoon, this section here has had some artistic license applied to it to get this and this uh, into the room as it was. So uh, typically a track down here would be about 90 feet and upwards, up as far as 200 feet, I think some of the bigger tracks were. Now, did, did they have to have, Wayne, did they have to have jumpers uh, for the lanes and so forth for power? Uh, yes, there were about two, typically, in each layout. There were, there were two pieces of track that got used every week. They were on the ends of each, on the, both ends of a length of wire. So, yes, they would put some, you know, I'm going to say three or four meter jumper tracks in the layout. So they run every week? No, they ran 23, 25 times a year. It the must organizers, take a long time to set that up, though. Well, yeah. Now the two oh, they build a track on the on the night. Yeah, they do. Wow. They build this, that track on the night and take it down at the end of the night. So you're saying that Luft has relatives in the UK? <laughs> well, it's all it's all plastic sectional. I think I think Phil, the fork truck driver, has a shift system. And he, uh, he goes in at about four o'clock in the afternoon, five o'clock in the afternoon to set the track. But he has helpers. It's all laid out on the tables and he knows how to lay his tables because he's done it all before and taken photographs and got records and one thing or another. So, uh, yeah, he, uh, racing starts about 7.30 and it's normally finished before 10. So as you can see, you could, you could see in the picture, it was, it's a child-friendly club and there's, a, there's always been a junior... Uh, championship as well as an adult one and when you join the club you basically bought two cars and um, these cars are fascinating because they're basically a motor cam with a guide pin and two axle slots mm -hmm. these bulkheads sit across between the uh, the main molding and this is actually the incorrect molding this is a Tyco 440x2 HO car but our ones were, this is just a stock picture that I found on the web today very quickly. 
But ours weren't quite the same as this, were they, Steve? Because we didn't have these wings on the on the on the chassis, did we? Correct. There's so, two there's two 440 chassis. There's a narrow and a wide one. Well, this is one I never actually handled. This must be a wide one. That's that's the wide one that fits on most of their sports car bodies, and then there's a narrow 440X as well. Well, that's the one we would have used. I'm going to click we on use the narrow 440X and the Super G, I think. Yeah. Super G Plus. Yeah. I think, a, I think there's an SG as well. That was the Super G Plus was the one we used for the sports car class, wasn't it? Well, that's the. Yeah, that's right. The, the classes, they used to call them open wheel and group C, didn't they? So basically it was open wheel. Yeah. Uh, and that had an ABS body. We'll, we'll come to that in a moment. And then the enclosed wheel used this or something very similar to this. To This is called a Super G Plus. Yeah. And uh, this is not one of our cars. This has got silicon tires on it, clearly, but that's not what we used. We used our cars in standard configuration. I've actually got some pictures of my cars coming along. Uh, so you'll see them, but here's a thing. This club asks for your, all your cars to be in park Fermi before any of the racing starts. So at seven 30, all the cars go into park Fermi. And this is a good real, what I think is, is what, one of the things that made the club really successful in so far as as soon as your cars were in park Fermi, you didn't touch them again till the end of the night and you were free then to, to, to concentrate on socializing and marshalling which obviously these big tracks with lots of turns need quite a lot of marshals. So, you know, most of the time, most of us were out there marshalling. I quite like the idea of having the cars in Park Fermi because it means that the focus could be on racing rather than um, prepping cars or trying to fix cars that aren't working. It's a bit do or die. You, you know, if your cars aren't working that night, you're in for a bad one. But um, that's a picture of my slot car box. My cars are there and there from that night. Um, but this is all I used to carry. This was it. Uh, one single glass top case and a little box with some tools in. I've got some spare axles here that might change the front. These, type, these, these uh, cars do run on their front wheels. Your guide pin, if your guide pin's running on the ground, so to speak, uh, carrying any weight, then it will catch on plastic track intersections. So these do use their front tires. So having a combine a set of um, alternative front axles and rear axles to get the ride height right was a critical thing. Uh, these are my cars, and I actually went in the attic at my mother, uh, my father-in-law's house just this week for you, so that I could get pictures of the way my cars came off the track in 2008 and went into the attic. And never to be seen again until last week. So yeah, that's my um, Super G Plus, and this one's got body pin tubes, which was a rare thing. But it has a Lexan shell, and I just happen to be fluorescent orange. And there's my body pin, which is obviously going rusty. And then there was a choice of basically two body shells, if I'm not mistaken, for the 440X2, wasn't there, Steve? This is one yeah. of them, and I believe that might be an IndyCar shell. But yeah. there was that, and there was there was basically one other. You could run with any Lexan body you liked. And this is the 2000 Lexan bodies with injection molded bodies. Yes. Well, you see, wow. I'll tell you more about how the way how the way the qualifying went. You would put your in or your F1 or your, your open wheel and your Group C into Park Fermi, and on this week you would be running your F1 car on the inside lane your group C in the next lane out, and then your F1 again in the third lane out, and your group C in the fourth lane. And you would run from one lane to the next, to the next, to the next, and that would be your qualifying over. You'd be in each lane for three minutes. And in between, you, you would get up on the rostrum and not get off until you'd done the full rotation. Right. So uh, you would run three minutes in each lane, and every lap to count, including mm -hmm. tenths, would be added together so you get 12 minutes qualifying and then you get a total number of laps plus a decimal and that would be run, your qualifying position you could run injection bodies with lexan bodies well we're running two different cars against one another so yes we were running lexan bodies on on super g pluses okay. plastic bodies 
Yeah, on, the sport uh, the, the sports cars were permitted to use Lexan bodies, but the open wheelers had to use the ABS one. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, you, you were running them simul simultaneously. So you got cars going you got the group C cars going around a lot faster than the F ones, basically, haven't you, Stephen? Yeah. The Super G's got stronger traction magnets and it's got a lighter body. Right. And I think the top speeds were very similar. I think the acceleration is slightly better on a Super G. But yeah, you'd have you'd have two types of car running in every qualifying race, but and you, then you, you ran pretty much stock cars other than the body, right? Everything yeah, on, everything on those four forties is stock. Yeah, everything. No, the the four forties you could do a lot of modifications with, but you couldn't modify the super Gs. I remember well, that four, we, we did uh, the lots of work yeah, with the four forty. The four okay. forties were all standard yeah, parts. They were stock. Oh, there were stock parts, but you could you could remove material. You could right, remove you a lot of chassis. Right, but you couldn't replace parts. Correct. You, there was a club rule that said um, any modifications that you do to your car, you could keep quiet, i.e. to yourself, for a maximum of two weeks, and then you had to tell everybody in the club what you were doing. But you put your cars in Park Ferme and the guy that handled the cars to put them on the start line for you, he would notice everything. He'd be, he'd be specking and teching cars yeah. every really? week. So, Wayne, are the rounds that you didn't win in 2007, the ones where you didn't show up? No, unfortunately not. I wasn't invincible, but I was close to it. This is my, this is my best season, and I don't know whether Stephen was actually along... In fact, Stephen, I've got bad so news for I you. I only did the one season at club level. Yeah, I can, I can only find evidence of you winning one race, I'm afraid. Yeah. So this is since the club began in 92, and these are the annual adult winners, and this was my time at the club. I was actually there for, I think, four, four or five seasons, but we, I think we started in 2004, and we learned to, through, through 2004 or five. And you, then, you, you, uh, you, it looks like you're the centre of HO over here. I'm the what? Sorry, Senna. Yeah. Well, I, we learned what to do, and we, you know, there. This is the. This is it. This is the one race, Stephen, and you're in this picture here. <laughs> yeah. I think this is. I think this is a photograph of the cover of the magazine that they used to produce, and this circuit's Thruxton, which is another UK circuit, and it's ninety odd feet. This one, and you won this one. Yeah, I believe that I was. It was there was some statement of what the was the when I won that particular event. Uh, I think I was the first person to win that had joined the club in the last ten years. Wow! Some, really? Yeah, the, the people that won every night were the people that have been in the club since the start. Yes, um, that was but yeah. Largely when, I, when, true. I won that particular, when I won that particular event, I was a new member, uh, and to have taken a win in me inaugural year was uh, was very very special. But uh, I only I only did it for that year because, I, like I say, I, I had a, a lot of contracts going in my rate in my RC world. Yeah, but you did quite basically. Well. You came in, did a mic drop, and left, right? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> And then I do I do the occasional uh, celebrity uh, <laughs> arrive and drive. Yeah, he did a few of those. So yeah, this, I was going to say, this, that's what happens when you get sponsorship. Oh, that was uh, all the RC car racing stuff. I was the yeah, same. The, spon the sponsorship was for the RC car racing. Yeah. So this uh, this is the reason that the uh, Derby HO Racing Club is known worldwide if it's known at all uh this is an eight lane 233 foot lap it's a american made brad's tracks track it was flown over in shipping cartons because of the connection with rolls royce and the aero engines um they can always get something shipped internationally for not much money on or free of charge if they need to and that was the only the only way that this was feasible 
And they run this um, 24 hour slot car race on a track, either this track or a track very similar to it, because they did build this in plastic in the beginning, didn't they? Yeah. You never saw it, but they did build it in plastic first. Sorry to interrupt, but when you say 24 hours, do you actually dim the lights so you drive at night or no? Unfortunately not, no. Uh, not at this event. Not at this, this event. This is HO scale. There's no lights on the cars or anything, is there? Well, I was going to say, even I'm glad, even with full lighting, how do you keep track of your car? I mean, it... Yeah. You can see the podium yeah. over there and you can see how far away this is the Mulsan corner and that the uh, this is the Mulsan kink, which in this circuit is flat. And this is the Mulsan corner. And uh, I don't know what the distance is, but you can see it's a sports hall size. So, yeah, a lot of people ask that same question, John. How do you keep track of your car? Well, you paint it fluorescent yellow or orange or green or something that really stands out. And they top out at about 20 miles per hour, would you say? I think we timed them down the straight, and they're about 2.3 seconds, weren't they, on the straight? No, a bit, bit, bit longer a bit, than that. A little bit longer. Might have been three seconds. Might have been 2.3 seconds to the kink. Yeah. Okay, so that means that if they fly off, they fly off like a projectile then. Yeah. Yeah. You could lose oh, an eye. I've seen, I've seen people... Uh, in particular, Watch on this box there, uh, in the corner of the room, looking for a car, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. What was the lap time there, Wayne? What was what was qualifying? Was it was it twelve? Eleven and a half. Eleven and a half. Yeah. You took pole position with an eleven and a half. Yeah. You, you don't this... need you don't need turn marshals. You need cats. Well. <laughs> Yeah, you've basically, I mean, this is a marshal number, a marshal point, and there's eight teams in each race. So there's only eight marshals. And they're all on, at this time, anyway, they're all on gym mats. They have now elevated this track. It all runs on tables nowadays, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, if, if they're not wearing hockey helmets, that you should at least give them a cricket batter's helmet or something, no? Well, I think you start with a cup, right? Well, do you know what? I didn't. I never got the impression that the danger levels were particularly high. Did you? No. I mean, no. No, no, I'm, I'm surprised health and safety were all over you guys. Well, look at the front of the look at the front of the rostrum. Nobody stood behind a barrier. Yeah. There's a there's a handrail up there, but there's nothing to stop anybody just falling off the front of the podium at this time, and it did happen. <laughs> <laughs> Reminds me a lot of the uh, the uh, oxygen twenty four hour race that they race in one thirty second scale on Ninco. Ah, uh, well, that that that's different. That that's similar but different. Well, yes, and it's different in many ways. But as far as yeah. a safety standpoint, if they're not worried about a one thirty second car coming off and hitting somebody at twenty miles an hour, I don't think an HO car is going to make a whole lot of difference. Well, these things they just hit you in the ankle. I mean, th th these people are probably sitting and lying down just on purpose so that they don't have to get up and fetch the car because if it hits you, if it hits it's your leg or something, it it, well, yeah. The little, the little I know about ballistics that you know, there's there's the difference between um, <laughs> huge organ damage and stopping power. <laughs> so this race was always held in uh, was always held in November, wasn't it, Steve? And it was the last round of the club championship when it was used with the. F1 and the Group C, the 440X2 and the Super G Plus. That was the last club night of the year. Yeah. And you would qualify alternate cars in each lane. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, all the laps from all the lanes would be added together for your qualifying. And then the pole position man would get lane choice. And the choice lane on this track is lane five, is it not? Yeah. That's the fifth one out from the inside, by the way. And that's why, in the previous photograph, my cars have got yellow dot stickers on them with lane numbers, because the last time they ran was on this track. They haven't got colour stickers on. They've got lane numbers. They've got lane five on the Group C car and lane one on the on the F1 car. So how, how did you fare in this race, win? I won. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I, 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 the table, the chart there, I mean, it's just a list of names and the very last one at the end is um, is always the Le Mans circuit, which they put up for Thursday night, club night, and it's there for free practice on Friday 
And then on Saturday morning, the 24 hour slot car race begins. And which are different cars, though, aren't they? Different car for the 24 hour race. Yeah. Yeah. And different so tyres. That is Brad's track's website. And this track is our is the Derby HO slot car track, and it's his pride and joy, if you like. It's not in his own, it's not even in his own country. But on the five occasions that we raced on there, we raced against Brad on at least four of those, didn't we? Yeah. He used to come, he used to come over and he used to bring a team of Americans. And unfortunately, the team of Americans were very, very hard to beat. Even th despite the fact that but they were beatable. They were beatable. <laughs> this is uh, this is um, this is how the, the the race begins, isn't it? This is immediately after driver briefing. Yeah. And all those boxes there contain a chassis, six motors, was it something like that? A um, couple yeah, of rear axles, greens and four, four reds. Yeah, something like that. Well, that's the colour of the wire on the wire. A, kit, the a kit of parts, and you were only permitted to use that kit of parts for the event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'd have all the axles, front tyres, guide blades, one chassis. Uh, they'd have silicon tyres in there, and there'd be two diameters of silicon tyres, wasn't there? Yeah. And you had, from the moment you picked up your box, you had a one hour where the circuit was open to build your car and run it. And then you went into qualifying with it, didn't you? And then yeah. after qualifying, that was it. That was your car for 24 hours. And usually a team was five people. Yeah. Oh. I don't have any more photographs to show you on that just yet. But <laughs> that track and what I had, <laughs> yeah, that track and what happened on that track and what happened in that hall is the reason that we ended up back in slot cars in 2016, 17, 18, isn't it? Yeah. And now you're getting into one thirty second scale. Well, you can tell, you, you, you're you aware of the link. There's a 24 hour uh, sports hall sized HO track taking place at Derby. And in 2000, I'm gonna guess five, six or seven, a certain Gary Skip came to race there. And that event, which is now 28 years in the running, I think the next one will be the 29th running uh, of the HO one, was the inspiration for the Disco Le Mans, which is the one you all know about because it's digital. Well, the one I know about because it's digital. Yeah, yeah. Well, that <laughs> one was the that one spawned the idea. Yeah. And Gar Gary came, and he was a teenager then, he wasn't was he? A, he was a young kid, wasn't he? He was, yeah. He was. <laughs> He's still a young kid. He's only in his early thirties. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's but yeah. He came along there, and that uh, he took that idea away with him, and uh, and and moved it to digital. Yeah, and that is what I'll get. I'll gather some more information about that. And um, well, I don't think we need to do it. That's what led to us coming back into slot car. I'll tell the story. Well, don't tell um, it now because we're all we're almost at the hour. We probably don't. yeah. Hold cool. a lot of time, but that was that's the same place that Gary holds the the oxygen twenty four hours. No, time. it's not the no. same hall. That that sports hall is in the Rolls Royce section, uh, Rolls Royce Sports and Leisure section. Unfortunately, looks, he's lost the sports hall he was using down at Warwick University. Yeah, it looks so it looks so familiar though. It, it's like are all this are all the indoor courts painted in that bright green color is that like normal or something it was oh, all the sports hall floor no the the walls <laughs> i don't know but yeah it, it looked like the same place that gary did his thing but maybe i'm just it's just mixing yeah it's similar my... size venue yeah same it's size a similar venue. size yeah yeah looks like big dan's got something there what you got big dan another motor uh, yeah, it's just, just to take just to take Wayne back a few years. He was talking about the open frame, um, you know, the early scale extras. That's one of the clamshell with the. That's RX the car. Open, that's the motor. It's not the car. But that's the motor, isn't it? Yeah, the list list the Jaguar body, and they just clip together. Yeah, we had one in a um, in a mini Clubman. Yeah, we did. We had one in a mini Clubman, and uh, we had two that were in 
uh, what, uh, yeah, single seater cars. Sled didn't we? I, I can't remember what they were. I think that's known as a sled, sled chassis. chassis. Yeah, with the, with the, it hinged, the, it hinged up, didn't it, at the front? Yeah, the body shell would stay attached on the, the rear axle. One, it hinged up at the front. Yeah, the, 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 the body shell would stay attached at the rear on the axle, wouldn't it? And it would pop up like that, like a drag car would. Yeah. yeah. I think it was called the power sledge or something like that. Power, power sledge. That's I've read it. that. That's yeah. it. And it's got that same motor. <laughs> so what? It, can I look Actually, at you? Dan, the, the power sledge was more of an ISO chassis. Yeah. Right? And the ones you're showing are, are a few years. Pro those, are, those are prior to... Um, the power sledge. It's a completely different car. Yeah, the, oh. yeah, the power the power sledge was later on. That was the you know the original clamshell style. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt for I'm just gonna stop the video. You guys can keep talking about motors and chassis and whatnot, but for now we're gonna stop the video. Everybody who's watching at a later date, come by for the live chat. What are you waiting for? Uh, until then, we will wave goodbye and then we'll keep chatting. Uh, bye bye. Next one's the big four zero. Yeah.